obviously not Michael Smith, according to the program. Uh, he has moved on to bigger and better pastures, although based on this morning's conversation, I think I got the better end of the deal to not be in D.C. at the White House today. Um, Michael is now the special assistant to the president for My Brother's Keeper, as well as an officer in Cabinet Affairs, and I have stepped in to serve as acting director for the Social Innovation Fund. So I am thrilled to be here. I'm also thrilled to be here because I've come full circle. I'm pleased to know many of you in this room, and so it's great to be connected. Although I sit here today and represent the government, we have as much at stake as anybody else in this room in terms of how do we solve some of our most pressing problems and recognizing that clearly government cannot do it all. We are thrilled uh, to be here and to be able to take back what I learned to talk about how we can break out and find new ideas to support philanthropy. I am joined by a very esteemed panel that I trust will set the bar high uh, as the opening session. Nothing against the other folks. Um, and so you have their bios. And so I'm just going to really dive in because I want to be mindful of time to keep us on schedule. But we have two videos and some graphics that we're going to show. So it's going to be interactive. And I guarantee to leave time at the end uh, for discussion from the audience. So first, we're going to have Catherine talk about her work at Digital Undivided. Well, awesome. It's, it's great to be here this morning. Um, I am a black person in tech. And I say that because I know it's like, I like to say I'm a professional unicorn. Um, <laughs> and, but my path to tech really took 30 years. And let me explain why. 30 years ago, my father was a displaced factory worker in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Um, he was a brewery worker. He worked at Schlitz Brewery. For those of you who know Laverne and Shirley, that's where he worked. Um, and the brewery shut down, and it devastated the community of Milwaukee. So my father found himself in his mid-30s at a workforce development center called OIC. Does anyone here know what, have heard of OIC before? Yeah, awesome. Uh, founded by Reverend Leon Sullivan in the 1980s. And there he met what we would say his, his second love after my mother, which was C++. And as a result of that, got an internship at IBM at 36, an unpaid internship at 36, I wanna stress that, um, and changed the fortune of my family and my community. And why that's important is that lesson, I was a small child when he was going through this process, when my family was going through this process, stayed with me my entire life. Um, and so of course, I didn't go to school for computer science, which is probably what I should have. Um, came out to the East Coast. I grew up on the tough and mean and tough streets of Minneapolis, Minnesota. Um, came out here for undergraduate and graduate school and became an epidemiologist, which was great preparation for my career as one of the first fashion bloggers. Uh, <laughs> um, I started a fashion blog in 2003. It grew into television and books and, and lots of other good stuff. In the middle of doing the Budget Fashionista, I was receiving all these emails from women who were starting tech-enabled companies, companies with the names of like LearnVest and Rent the Runway and all of these great companies. And I thought, you know what? I can do this. I have this platform. Let me start a company. So I had this idea in 2006 to start Birchbox for Black Women and entered into one of the first incubators here in New York. And it was at that point that I had probably one of the most challenging experiences of my life. It was the first time in my life where I had diminished expectations. Actually, I had no expectations. And that was very difficult. For those of you who are overachievers, you know that nothing's worse than people thinking that you can't achieve. And it was the first time in my life that I experienced that in this incubator. Of the 40 people who were participating, there were three women. There was one black person, that's me. Um, and no one called on me. I was never invited to speak or pitch. Um, in fact, when I did pitch, it was silence in the room because they were surprised that I could talk. Um, and the comments that I got wasn't a challenge to my business model or how am I going to scale or any of those business questions. The questions I got were, you know, Catherine, we don't think you can relate to other black women because you have an accountant. And, you know, or Catherine, do you know any fashion bloggers? And I'm like, well, I was one of the first fashion bloggers. It was questions that obviously showed that they did not value 
me, my idea, and who I was. And so that stuck with me. Years later, I came on to blog her. Um, blog her is a national organization, over 40 million women bloggers. They just sold to a larger company earlier this week. And from there, I had this idea to do this conference, basically a gathering of black women like myself. Um, and so in 2012, we held our first Focus 100 conference here in New York City. We had over 150 folks. We had no idea how many people were coming. No one had ever done anything like that before. And as a result, we created this community. And the community has grown since that point. And we've had over 55 Focus Fellows. We've served over 1,000 folks via our events around the country. Um, we're very active on the Twitter. Uh, that's where we do a lot of our advocacy work, particularly in getting more folks in the tech pipeline. We've reached over 325 million, I think at this point, impressions via Twitter and social media. But the thing that we're most proud of is what's going on with our Focus Fellows. Over 30% have raised angel or VC funding. These are black women who are founders or co-founders of tech companies. That's an extremely significant number because the national average is around 1% for the black population as a whole. So we're at several times more than that national average. And then we've also looked at what happened to the folks that didn't raise. And what we found is that we were creating this pipeline to leaders. Several of our Focus Fellows are in top tech companies. Uh, four of our Focus Fellows are at Uber. Um, many of you may know Uber. Um, several are at Facebook. We have some at Snapchat now. And we found that we were creating this pipeline and having this sort of major impact in moving our community forward through the use of technology. So with that, you stood up there. You shocked them that you could talk. You obviously have progressed to place people in companies that are clearly under fire, and you've achieved venture capital. So we are slowly but surely moving past the first. What do you see on the horizon when we have this new majority from an investment community and also from a philanthropic community? We're breaking barriers from a gender and race perspective. Will the dollars follow? Or what are things that you would say to this group of how they should begin to thinking about investing in a community that's been marginalized? Well, I think it there has to be sort of a renaissance in investment, both the venture investment as well as philanthropy. And I think that looking at measurements um, and looking at who's truly moving the needle and getting away from some of the legacy investments. Um, case in point, I was having a discussion with a, a well-known philanthropy group about Ferguson and what was happening in St. Louis. And you know, I said to them, a lot of the organization that happened in Ferguson happened via Twitter. A lot of the movements that you saw was happening via social media. It wasn't happening via the very traditional um, organizations that you normally write the really large checks to. It, it's happening in sort of these small pockets. You have citizen activists now. You have people like myself who are starting organizations and not necessarily going to work for the more traditional path. So I think as a philanthropist, it's looking at and really exploring where the action is happening and looking outside of the traditional boxes. And I know that's hard when you don't have a lot of time or when you know others in your group are used to funneling money to one particular group, but that's going to be very important in the future is rethinking how you do investments, doing a lot more um, investing in terms of PRI, so maybe not you know, necessarily traditional charitable investments. Thinking of also how your funds are invested in traditional VC funds. So a lot of VC funds get a lot of their money from you, you guys, your funds. And a lot of VC funds are not diverse. They're not investing in diverse organizations. They're not investing in women and people of color. And you guys can put pressure on them to do so. Um, and that's something that doesn't cost you anything other than putting pressure and influence on that. So. And the other piece before we move on is, is the social capital. So bringing those folks together, I've had the privilege to see your work and hear about it. Talk about that balance of social capital yeah. and not just breaking out the box and finding investments, but how do they find and get into other communities? In terms of the philanthropists? Yes. 
I think the best way to find and get in other communities is to come to events like this, to be really, really honest, um, and interact with people who are not in your space. And, and, and it's hard, it's hard to break out of your comfort zone, right? It's hard to go into these different spaces. Um, one of the first things I would say is if you are not on social media, and particularly Twitter, you must get on Twitter right now. You, that's like, I mean, literally during that 15 minute break we have after this, <laughs> like sign up for Twitter, get your Twitter account. <laughs> Um, and the reason why is a lot of conversations, a lot of, particularly for those of you who are in progressive communities and doing work in progressive communities, a lot of that conversation is happening on Twitter. It, it's pretty much that that is where it's happening, to a lesser degree Facebook. And if you're going to stay relevant and you want to really know what's going on and keep a pulse of what's going on in the communities out there, you really have to be engaged on Twitter. You, re you really do. It's not an option anymore. Gotcha. Well, I got on it to follow my kids. Now I know what to do with this. Yeah, so thank right, you. exactly. <laughs> so next I want to invite Mark Silver into the conversation, who's a global award-winning filmmaker. Um, so I'd after we think we're going to show his clip, his trailer to Who is Diane Crystal. These people, as much as they are invisible in life, they're invisible in death. It's very hard to identify them. Nobody's out there searching for them. Diane Crystal was definitely an atypical case. Who's this person? We don't have any report of somebody who was missing that had those tattoos. We're trying to see if somebody knows this person and try to ID them. En vida era considerado invisible, un ilegal. Ahora en la muerte es un misterio por resolver. Nunca podré entender la dimensión de los peligros que enfrentó. Solo puedo tratar de recorrer sus pasos. People sneaking across the border. To my mind, the problem is all economic. The American capitalist economy needs blue collar labor. For me, it's very frustrating knowing that somebody had a dream, but they ended up being a number, a statistic. So Mark, tell us about yourself and your work and how you got to know about Diane Crystal. I spend so little time on Twitter, I was just thinking. <laughs> <laughs> I never have time to look at it. Um, well, about six years ago, we launched a website in London that asked people to send in stories of resistance against general uh, walls and barriers and division between rich and poor. And I think we had about 300 stories come in over the space of a couple of months. Um, and the one that was most uh, powerful, metaphorically, was a story of skeletons in the desert of Arizona. And uh, there was an image of uh, police holding a skull, like quite an epic Shakespearean image. So we started asking ourselves, what can this one skull in the desert reveal to you about the world? Um, huge problems, transnational problems, economic problems, othering problems, like basically everything we wanted to talk about in a film. So we managed to uh, get ourselves embedded with the search and rescue police in Tucson in Arizona when they were recovering the bodies um, and started figuring out the kind of jigsaw puzzle in terms of film that we would need access to. So the search and rescue people the morgue where the bodies are brought back to, uh, and then at that time, the Mexican consulate who try and identify the families of the people that they find in the desert. Um, actually, the Diani Cristal case, uh, he was actually from Honduras, so then we shifted over to the Honduran government, and then we're lucky enough that uh, this particular person was identified uh, 
relatively quickly compared to most people. Um, and his family we eventually managed to get in touch with. And they gave us, the, if you like, the final piece of the jigsaw puzzle, which was access to the home, the village, the funeral. Um, that took about, just that part of the film took about uh, 18 months on and off. When we had all of that done, um, in parallel, we had made uh, some short films for Amnesty about the human rights abuses of migrants traveling through Mexico. So essentially like from Honduras to back to Arizona. Um, and the rest of the film, or the other half of the film, is us making that journey, kind of retracing the footsteps of this particular person who died, but also a kind of every man approach, um, which took us through the river crossing from Guatemala into Mexico, and then the uh, human rights kind of shelter network that's there to provide support for migrants. And then, as you saw in the trailer, the, um, the tra riding on the roof of trains, which is how most migrants get through Mexico to the point in Arizona where the guy died. And then we intercut these two stories. We're now about four years. <laughs> Um, and then in addition to that, because we never felt that, um, we, we kind of perceived that the film, that the skull kind of conceptually sat in the middle of a big project of which the film was just one part. And then we also used, because the film only, you know, is a 90 minute film, but we had about hundreds of hours of material. So all of that material then became content for uh, a website, an iBook. And then we built up a huge amount of NGO and activist partners from Honduras, Mexico, and the US who could then use all that material for their own advocacy work. So essentially, we'd taken this um, small micro human story um, that had all these different issues that different NGOs and different activists could sort of magnetize or take. So if you were interested in, for example, development at home, there were some parts of the story you could like pull out. If you're interested in the detention system, there was another part of the story. So that we were true to the story, but we were designing it in a way that we knew that it could be used by, um, if you like, more than just a kind of art house film community. Um, and now I guess we're, we're just coming down from uh, that five year experience and now uh, I'm actually just finishing a film about the shooting of Jordan Davis mm -hmm. in Florida which is um, again in in conceptual terms um, you know the story of one person who was killed um, but again speaks to um, much bigger issues than mm -hmm. just this one person mm -hmm. so in that case it was racial profiling and access to guns and then a law uh, that essentially gives people the confidence to, right. to use that gun. Right. And again, all just takes place around this very small one person story and one family's horror mm -hmm. of what they had to go through from the, from the death to getting any sense of justice. So you pick such light topics. Yeah, it's really chilled. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm, I'm curious when we, when we heard Berta talk about the sneakers. So being from New York, I'm familiar yeah. with that, right? So I, I, I and that, and yeah. so you know people know that, um, yeah. but it oftentimes doesn't get any visibility. And so now we have YouTube, which has anybody can get a channel. Yeah. But these stories, right? We can't see, but access to media seems to be cheaper. So what are some of the barriers that you found, and how were you able to break through to make such a great film? Um, well, I think one of the, I mean, positive. I think one of the things that really helped was the. Uh, access to very affordable uh, cameras which make everything look cinematic. So when we started this, I think we only had to spend about £4,000 on equipment at the very beginning. Where, I mean, we, we carried on kind of investing in lenses and all that, and now that's probably around £15,000 worth of equipment, which is really like nothing to, in terms of empowering us to be able to be very intimate with the story, but so not need a whole crew there with lighting and scaffold, you know, all the rest of it. it. It literally just needs me and sometimes one other person to um, essentially like create images and stories that have cinematic power. Um, but the, that, the, <laughs> the difficult part is just sustainability. So 
to get any one of these stories off the ground, I, I used to think that would cost around $20,000 just to be able to um, shoot a three or four minute trailer that could then you could then use for fundraising. That's probably now gone up to about $100,000 because of needing to not only do the story but network with people who can actually use the story afterwards. And we, we try and do that from the very beginning so that we know what issues we're looking for in the metaphor, if you see what I mean. Um, so, yeah, that just, just getting access to the story and getting everything set up in the way that we know that will be healthy by the time the film's finished um, is about $100,000. And that's, that initial funding in the film world is really hard to get, especially in documentary, because no one wants to give you money unless you can prove you've got the story. Um, and it's hard to get the story unless you've got the money to spend the time getting the story. Um, and then from that point on, so even we've been very fortunate with very supportive partners. Um, and even, even with that support, um, you know, the time where someone says they will agree to put money into a film, and then when you actually see it in the, the bank account can be you know, six to eight months later by the time all the paperwork's done and blah, blah, blah is done. Um, and that makes, that just keeps you on the edge the whole time, basically. That, that would be the great part. If you, could, um, if you could step back from the edge and concentrate more on the story, uh, that would be helpful, I think, for filmmakers. And what's going to happen with Downey Crystal? Where will the movie go? Um, well, it's, it's already, it's been out um, in the States and now it's, uh, on its uh, digital release in the States, and I think it's coming out in a couple of European countries over the next couple of months. Um, and I mean, what, that's all great, but I, I mean, personally, I don't really mind that once it's piratable, that's when it starts getting interesting, because then anyone can have <laughs> access to it. Um, it's very frustrating, the distribution uh, rollout takes so long. Mm -hmm. Um, and when so many grassroots organizations want to or need to use the film, um, that part can be very frustrating in the first few months. Um, but yeah, now, now it's out there. Um, and it is and will be and has been you know, used by, and it, it's great. And, and actually, that, I do find out about that on Twitter, because uh, <laughs> the, uh, the distributors move on. You know, once they've released the film, they don't, you know, they're, they're making money off then not that our film not the documentaries make that much money but you know they're focusing on new projects and uh, hopefully if it's a good film the, f the film doesn't you know when, when it's launched that's the end for many people involved in a film but for the film it's kind of just the beginning you know that's where its life begins so yeah for me that's the most interesting part when when anyone can have access to it um, and use it for their own advocacy work. Um, that, that, for me, is where it gets interesting. So we'll come back and talk more about what's the business model of open source. But yeah, or well, lack of business <laughs> model. Yeah. I'd like to bring Anne into the conversations with Harvard, who is, again, taking on major issues of poverty around the world. Can you share a little bit about what you're doing and how it's happening? Yeah, for sure. Um, I think, like many of us in the room, I wear a bunch of different hats. Um, one is uh, heading up a program at the Harvard School of Public Health that's focused on fighting human trafficking and particularly um, the trafficking of children, both in our country, here in the US, as well as globally. Um, and another thing I'm really deeply engaged in is impact investing. Um, and I, I've been really fascinated just in the various worlds I currently inhabit um, around this theme of collaboration. And, and that was mentioned earlier in the, the welcoming remarks. Um, and I, I feel like what's going on is we're dealing with these problems of such complexity, of such magnitude, that we have to step outside of our institutional comfort levels, across, reach across to other institutions, um, uh, often reach across sectors. Um, you mentioned the need for government to engage in partnerships with philanthropy and, and of course, uh, the corporate world. Um, and, and one of the ways in which I'm seeing this manifest that I'm working uh, deeply with is this new campaign called Divest Invest. And I, I'm just curious to know how many of you know about this. 
And how many of you are participating? So tweet about it so other people know about it. Yeah, so um, <laughs> just super, super briefly for those who aren't familiar with it, um, Divest Invest as a campaign started up on university campuses in 2012. Of course, taking a page from the anti-apartheid divestment movement in the 80s that definitely had a role in um, exerting adequate pressure, uh, among other pressures, on the apartheid regime in South Africa. And um, back in 2012, I think there was a feeling among all of us, but it was the students who initially took uh, action, that climate change negotiations were just paralyzed, right? Nothing was getting done in policy, either in our country or at the global level. So, so what could we do? So a bunch of enterprising students got together um, and have composed a, a campaign that's gained pretty powerful momentum over the last couple of years. I think Swarthmore was the first college to divest of fossil fuel securities and take, take on the commitment also to invest in alternative energy securities. Um, uh, Stanford is the most recent kind of headliner to do so. Um, so fast forward, last year, a, a, a friend of many of us in the room, uh, Ellen Dorsey of the Wallace Global Fund, decided that, well, where's philanthropy in all of this? I mean, what do we exist for um, except to exert leadership, disrupt the status quo? Can't we use our investment capital to advance um, some kind of response to climate change here. Grant making is critical, of course, uh, but let's use the whole toolkit here. So Ellen, um, we were, I, I serve as the chair of the investment committee for a foundation up in Boston called the John Merck Fund, which cares deeply about climate change, environmental health, and we happen to have a robust impact investing strategy going. Um, so Ellen knew that we were kind of low-lying fruit. She called us and asked us if we would be early adopters of this campaign, now called, this sleeve of foundations participating is called Divest Invest Philanthropy. And um, we're kind of an old-fashioned four-square foundation. We barely have a website, so we get <laughs> the importance of technology, and yet um, we culturally like to fly under the radar. We don't, you know, we just don't really want to be out there, partly out of humility, which is a good thing, partly out of just possibly habit, not such a good thing. Um, so we had to think long and hard about this, even though our values were closely aligned with the campaign. We finally decided, look, I mean, this is ridiculous. Let's just get over this aversion to publicity. Let's get out there. Um, by January of this year, Ellen was able to get up there and announce that 17 foundations had joined Divest Invest Philanthropy. Um, fast forward to September of this year, um, Ban Ki-moon, right? So here we are in New York, um, Global Climate Change Summit at the UN. Uh, Ban Ki-moon was able to announce that 70 foundations have adopted um, this commitment to the campaign. And I'll tell you exactly what the commitment is in a minute. Um, aggregating about $50 billion. So it's not a whole lot of money in capital markets terms, but uh, it's enough money to be heard. Um, so what is, what is the commitment? Um, essentially, this is the old-fashioned part of it. We're called on to divest of fossil fuel securities in whatever way we find to be most intelligent and impactful. So initially the campaign asked that foundation endowments um, unload their fossil fuel securities as defined by the filthy 15, you know, the top 15 bilging companies, um, and the Carbon Tracker 200, another list of extractive uh, fossil fuel based companies. Um, However, as time's gone on and we've become more nuanced uh, and as more really interesting thinkers have come into the campaign, uh, we've loosened up on that you know, kind of plain vanilla formulation of how to divest. Um, the invest piece, I think, is really interesting and compelling and frankly, the more fun aspect of this, which is to harness 
at least 5% of your foundation, our foundation endowment um, investment capital um, to allocate to clean energy technologies. So let's help <laughs> fill that capital gap, which is estimated to be a trillion dollars that's necessary to go into clean tech technologies between now and 2030 if we're going to be able to come up with the strategies we need to arrest and mitigate climate change um, and save the planet. <laughs> so um, the basic ask is to commit to divest, invest, to talk um, among you know, your board, your staff, figure out how you want to uh, express the commitment and then you know get going. Um, I think the thing I'm most startled by about this campaign is I tend to be kind of cynical about campaigns um, and I thought okay this is great this is a PR message that we you know as foundations out there for the public good really should be making um, but you know that's it that's that's what this is all about. What I've appreciated in the last months of, as we've been working through this in our foundation and as I've been working with um, the campaign to help foundations figure out how the heck to do this, um, we have learned so much from each other uh, as foundations, uh, sharing best practices, this community of practice has come into being. So I think this campaign for me really illustrates the power of a single foundation, the Wallace Global Fund, to step out there, really exert leadership, bring a bunch of us to the table um, in, a, in a meaningful way, um, to collaborate together, which is something we don't always do that well in foundation world, um, and then also to give us a, a real framework for expressing um, our desire to engage in impact investing. Um, you know, I don't, there's a lot of controversy over whether the divest piece of this will have any impact. It's clearly strong as a symbolic message um, to capital markets, to the companies that are still busy extracting um, petroleum, uh, even though, you know, in investment circles now there's a whole lot of discussion about whether they're ever going to see any money from, from those caches. <laughs> um, but I, I do, I think, you know, as foundations, we're growing in um, participating in this campaign. And I know for sure history's on our side uh, in terms of the impact that we can make through sending this signal. And then, of course, on the invest side, bringing capital, you know, seed capital, um, growth capital, all the way up to some of the public companies that are out there doing really, really uh, innovative work in, in alternative energy. We can make a huge difference as a, as a sector, as the foundation sector. So um, I'm psyched to answer any questions and uh, either while we're up here or offline. So the, so the one question, uh, one congratulations, because I think oftentimes we know there's a 95% and the 5% within a foundation. And so getting 5% out of 95 is significant. So, so kudos. Is this something, I guess, what were some of the triggers? Is something you were already talking about? Because that's not an easy process. We've seen it with Kellogg and trying to unlock the 100 million from there and down to impact investing. Was it hard? What was that process like? And do you think now you've set a course where you can continue to do that in an ongoing way, or is it just going to be limited to the campaign? Well, I, I do think this is transformative for um, the sector in that we're learning that we can do this, and we can do this without leaving performance on the table. Um, you know, there are a lot of kind of naysayer investment consultants, investment advisors who'll say, oh, you can't do this, you know, you'll, you, you won't be meeting your benchmark, asset allocation, all this stuff. I'm like, really? I mean, come on, guys, let's be a little more creative here. Um, and so what we're finding in the impact investing industry generally is increasing um, capacity on the part of the investment advisors to help us as foundations um, invest in a way that's aligned with our charitable goals uh, intelligently without leaving performance on the table. And this is not, this, I'm not restricting this to um, climate change. Of course, um, community development, there's so many different ways that we can put our investment capital to work. Um, you name it, human rights even. 
Um, I'm starting a discussion to develop a human rights fund, which I'm really excited about, and I have no idea what that's going to look like yet, other than... Mark, I hear, needs some money for his next fund. <laughs> <laughs> we'll talk. Um, but I do, I do think this, is, this particular campaign, because it's so big, because it's so public, it's, we've gone global now, we're targeting a tripling of the numbers of foundations to, um, that are participating by the end of 2015, when the next big UN climate change summit occurs. Um, so I think it's really teaching, we're teaching ourselves that we can do this. We're also, you know, dragging the investment community along, kicking and screaming. So it, it's unbelievable to me how um, traditional investment managers like BlackRock are scrambling to answer to their clients' demands for fossil fuel-free investment products. Um, so it's really making an impact, I think, systemically. Great. So we have three examples of different sectors that committed to social change, and underlying each of them is some element of a business model. So I want to come back to you, Catherine. Talk about kind of what you're learning for Digital Undivided, the business model. Uh, and how that, what, what you've learned and what aspects are sustainable and what aspects still kind of need some reinforcement? Oh gee, that's a really tough question and a great question. Um, there's a couple of things that we've learned, uh, particularly in the past year. Um, one of the things that we've learned is particularly in this whole diversity in tech, which is a really hot topic right now, um, if you haven't heard, it's like a lot of discussions. It's less than 2% of um, tech is black. I think less than 3% is Latino. It's, it's not good numbers. Um, so it's a really hot topic right now. But what we have found is um, that, that while there's interest, the money doesn't exactly match the PR interest. And, and that's been um, a big issue for us. The money is not there to necessarily build the pipeline. And I think it's um, a little bit due to the nature of tech. Uh, any of you who have ever worked with techie know a techie, love a techie, or if you're a techie, you know that they want things right now. And, and meaning like today, at this moment, <laughs> um, the, the issue is, is that there hasn't been investment in the tech pipeline to create the diverse talent to be able to then go work at these companies or to then be able to go and create uh, new companies and new tech-enabled businesses. So it's been a challenge for us because our business model is a combination of working with um, partners and sponsors, uh, some fee for service, is that finding that, that partner money is just not there at the scale that it needs to be to really have the impact and really create the pipeline. And it's interesting because it's not just an issue that we face, it's pretty much all our colleagues in this space are also facing similar issues. I um, mean, it's a really interesting sort of problem. What we've done though, um, is that we've looked at creating really a sort of public-private partnership model. So we're working with the city of Portland, of all cities, um, Portland, unfortunately, has the title of being the whitest large city. Um, and they don't want that title anymore. And so, um, and it also happens to be a very innovative community. And so we've been doing work with them for the past year, and we're working on a, um, what we like to call sort of a pre-accelerator, pre-incubator um, to start in February. And it's bringing in the Portland Economic Development Corporation, the city of Portland, local corporations like Nike and Intel, as well as the local startup community, all of which are giving funding to this, all of which are giving space and, and, and brain power. And we're really excited about that because we think that that's going to be a model that is going to be scalable to other cities and it's also going to be a more sustainable business model because just depending on tech companies is, isn't going to hack it. Gotcha. And so going from campaign to campaign, so we know the... Mitch and Free Caper have done a lot mm -hmm. around raising this, lots of visibility. What, what, it, what do you think is going to trigger moving from just getting the message right to actually solving the problem? Well, I think definitely supporting organizations like Digital Undivided. I mean, we, we not only solve the problem, we measure the solutions that we're providing. Mm -hmm. 
um, so that then we can go and communicate how we're solving and showing the numbers and you know understanding the importance of being able to demonstrate performance. I think um, that's going to be really key is supporting the organizations that are actually moving the needle right now. Um, it's it's not as many organizations in the space that are doing that just because tech is such a hard space to sort of get into, particularly if you're from an outside sort of point of view. Um, I think definitely these sort of public-private partnerships working with local governments, national governments, and with the startup communities, and with sort of established corporations, and with you know community-based social enterprises like us, and getting them all in the room and all working together to, to go sort of towards this goal, I think is going to be really crucial. I think that's really going to be the path to make this successful and to create a sustainable pipeline. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you talked about collaboration and you talked about collaboration. You, you didn't talk about it as explicitly. Could you talk about the business model for you, but also all these grassroots groups? Because that sounds like a hefty lift in terms of you creating product that then they have to redistribute. And, and it's unclear to me where the money's coming from. So talk a little about that. It won't take long for me to answer that. There's no, <laughs> <laughs> there's no business model. Um, <laughs> I mean, I, I, I don't, from, from where I come, I, I know there are other people in the documentary industry who would be able to explain a business model. I, I don't have a business model. I just have a, um, do I broadly think this story needs to be told? Um, and who would be interested in using the story. Um, and the financial side of it is so tight and there's so little or no profit to be made from it that I don't consider that the business model is anything to do with finan finances, mm -hmm. financial. Um, I th I like the, mo the motivation for getting involved in documentary is to essentially like propagate a message. And I think that's hard to put a financial value on that. And if I think about even, I was just thinking of, uh, like I remember the, the films that I saw that had an impact on me, I don't know, from the age of like 13 to 16, which essentially like brings me to be sitting here and uh, there's no you know, financial relationship to, to that inspiration or the, the kind of chaos theory that came of watching that documentary that day. Um, so yeah, I, just, I, don't, I don't perceive the world of social change documentary within a financial return sort of environment. But th that said, um, I think but for us and the people I know, it's about creating these sort of mutually beneficial relationships with people who, or organizations or activists or whoever, uh, who see the value in that story getting out and understand the power of that story goes beyond money. So I guess that's just a different type of economics. Mm -hmm. um, we're, there's actually a few of us who are setting up um, obviously I'm not putting in the money part of it, just the creative part of it, but anyway, setting up a fund that um, allows people who are interested in all different aspects of social change, so whether that's environment or race or immigration or whatever the subject, um, who, can then under who can then see that there's this palette of stories being developed in the next, realistically, like two to five years at any one time, that they can um, put money into and get a return, albeit unlikely to be financial, um, but a return from that investment. Um, and that return is the kind of spider's web and empowerment of the network that builds up around that story. I don't, I don't know if that's any use to anyone sitting <laughs> in this room, but. Well, so the impact investment, is your impact first versus financial first, maybe is what we would say. But, but they're clear, what I'm, but what I will take away is they're clear quantitative measures in terms of number of people have seen it, the impact it's had on the groups, the amplification through these social activists all across the country in addition to Twitter feeds, et cetera. Yeah, and, um, and I think those types of projects rely on uh, you know, people who are willing to take the risk that they might not see a return mm -hmm. on the money or they're just set up not mm -hmm. to need a return, so foundations mm -hmm. and everything. That said, all, all of the uh, 
So r roughly, we need to raise around, uh, let's say, 1.2 million for, for a, a good feature-length mm -hmm. doc with the beginnings of an outreach campaign and online presence okay. and everything else. Um, so that you might, you might eventually get to see some of that money back. So the, the contracts that we have with all the different funders um, is, is done in this waterfall type system. So e eventually most people get their money back. Sure. Sure. Um, but it's not a quick. Sure. So in the vein of collaboration, and we're going to go out to the audience. If you have questions, raise your hand. I know we have some roving mics. Um, but building on this topic you brought of collaboration and then to the one that we started with, kind of thinking outside the box, people are betting a lot on impact investing. And there's, luckily, we've moved from the debate of where does it fall and what's included and what's not. But what are three things you would say to folks who are sitting with pots of money, whether they're a program officer or they're a high net worth individual, to kind of think about if they're exploring impact investing? Are there particular sectors? Are there internal processes? Is there a framework they should have as they move forward? Yeah, well, I think the first thing I would say is if you have an investment consultant or advisor who says it can't be done, fire them. <laughs> um, and there's so many resources now uh, to support a foundation or a, an in, a independent philanthropist setting out on this path. Um, confluence philanthropy is one that I think is really useful and helpful. Um, Rockefeller Philanthropy Advisors, RPA, has issued a couple of handbooks that I think are super helpful. Um, so that's one thing. Another thing uh, is what I mentioned earlier, which is this myth that in order to engage in impact investing, you know, we leave performance on the table is just absurd. I mean, at this stage in the growth of the industry, it's just not necessary to leave performance on the table. You can, you may choose to. But for anybody who's trying to shut the conversation down, either on your board, on your staff, external to your foundation, um, challenge them. You know, obviously arm yourselves first <laughs> so that you can challenge them with some, some good solid information. But pretty much across asset classes now, with one exception, hedge funds. I'm having a hard time with hedge funds. Um, you can find a way to express your charitable objectives through your investment activity, whether that's through equity, public or private, through debt, through cash. Um, with, with the alternatives, I found one hedge fund that um, I really love, and, and this is a guy who walks the talk. It's a, it is a kind of um, clean energy, clean solutions hedge fund. And uh, he's shorting some of the nasty building right, companies, which is really fascinating because um, it's gotten the impact investing world with its knickers all in a twist over whether it's OK to hold these companies, even though they're being shorted. But anyway, so that's, that's the second one. Know that you can um, meet your risk and return objectives, even though you're engaging with this dual um, agenda generating financial return, generating whatever social or uh, environmental impact you're after. And then, um, let's see, one of three things. Oh, we What's can go with two, two is good. <laughs> DC, one, everything is three in DC. So just, um, <laughs> yeah, fair enough. Um, I guess I'll stop. Maybe it'll come back to me and I'll oh, jump in. Sure. Question, yes ma'am. Oh wait, hold on. Only it's okay, not I got us. it, I oh. got it. Okay. <laughs> Um, so we're all madly in love with asset allocation strategies, right? Let's diversify our investment portfolios to mitigate risk and make sure that when one asset class is up and another's down, we don't you know, get, get out over our skis and lose too much value in our portfolio. Um, with hedge funds, what I'm doing now is challenging our love affair with asset allocation strategies and saying, look, what if we can't engage in impact investing in the alternatives asset class. Let's just park it, not worry about it, and fill out the rest of our asset allocation strategy. So I think that would be my third message. Um, if your external expert advisor or an internal expert advisor is telling you, oh, you can't do this because you can't actually fill out all the asset classes and still be true to your impact goals, challenge them. Um, you own the assets. We own these assets. And we are paying for this advice. Let's make sure we get good advice and the advice that um, aligns with our goals. 
great, thank you. Thank you for waiting. No problem. Um, I have a question about the invest part of divest invest. Um, to really create a new energy economy, we're gonna need new ideas and new ideas, I think, for the most part, come from new companies, from startups who need seed stage capital, which is you know relatively small increments. They need to move quickly. Um, and oftentimes, you know, these organizations or companies haven't been around long enough to be able to document any kind of success. They have no metrics to be able to demonstrate that this is, you know, a really, uh, is going to necessarily work. Um, and when you think about foundations, you think about slow moving, you think about process and procedure, uh, you think about, you know, really high expectations in terms of being able to demonstrate right off the bat that what you're going to do is going to work. And I think it bears itself out in the numbers. So I think the Global Impact Investing Network recently released a study that said, of, you know, of all the impact invest, uh, investments out there globally, only 3% are being allocated towards seed stage. Um, and so I think there's a real disconnect between, you know, what our objectives are and, uh, you know, where money is actually going. And so I was curious if you had any thoughts about how foundations and the philanthropic community should be thinking about reallocating, you know, the stage of investing that they're doing. Yeah, it's a great question. Um, uh, I was at a conference yesterday up in Boston on this topic, and it was family foundations and um, yeah, and family offices coming together with some folks who are out there doing really interesting entrepreneurial things, um, building companies. One guy is heading up a lab at MIT, um, bringing students in to build new enterprises that will answer to this need. Um, and I think. Um, there are different ways to crack it as a foundation. Um, we can allocate a certain percentage of our investment portfolio to new, new ideas, right? And take a risk that way. We can certainly use our PRIs to provide some seed capital if we want to. We can certainly provide grant <laughs> funding to support the MITs, the Stanfords, wherever these um, incubation labs are around the country, around the world. Um, and then I think just with straight up market rate tech investing um, to provide seed capital, capital um, there's some affiliation groups out there, and I certainly don't know all of them, but um, one that I participate in here in New York is called CREO. Um, I don't know if anybody's heard of it, but it's, um, it's a member of the Adam Wolfenson and Martin Whitaker of Just Capital. Um, and then Jason Scott of Eco Assets. Um, so they've come together to form this network of um, family offices, family foundations that really want to invest in um, clean energy alternatives, um, seed capital mostly. I mean, a little bit of um, growth capital as well as in the mix. So that would be one network that that you know you might want to get involved with, um, where you can access expertise readily and swap ideas with, with like-minded folks. Um, another is Tonic, right? So we have gin, so now we have Tonic. And Tonic is um, the brainchild of Charlie Kleisner of the KL Felicitas Foundation. And Tonic isn't exclusive to um, the new energy economy, uh, but it is all seed capital um, across the, the different sectors that we might care about including clean energy. Um, so that's an awesome resource. And you know, basically, if you want to agree to participate, you have access to the meetings and ideas and expertise on structuring a deal. Um, so those would be a few thoughts. And I'm happy to talk with you more after. Thank you. Other questions? Don't be shy. Um, so I have a question for uh, Catherine and also for Anne. So Anne, uh, I work on a number of uh, diversity councils for different corporations and some of the CEOs have told me that since they're under such pressure always to be measured by the market, it would help if investors would put diversity on the table mm -hmm. as one of the things that they are going to look at in investments because that then gives the CEOs uh, more permission with stockholders to actually invest some time and money in that. I'm wondering if there's any discussion about that uh, way of uh, foundations influencing what's going on. And then related to that, in the immigration debate, there's long been an issue in terms of the H-1B workers and whether they displace uh, particularly African Americans in the mm -hmm. tech sector. And I've talked mm -hmm. to uh, 
uh, Microsoft and uh, some of the other tech companies about the fact that, that while they put a lot of money into scholarships, minority scholarships, there seems to be a disconnect in terms of their hiring. And I'm wondering if anybody's really looking at that area to figure out what's really going on. So Catherine, why don't you go ahead? <laughs> um, I, I think kids are cute. <laughs> kids are cute and kids are easy. And, and that's why I think you see a lot of focus on the scholarships. Um, it, it's much easier to give a scholarship to a kid than it is to figure out how to give their parents a job. Um, and so I, I think that that's one of the things that, that we're seeing because we primarily work with adults. We work with folks who are over 18. And there's a reason why we do that. Um, and there's a reason why we focus primarily on women. We know that one of the most influential groups in our community is black women. And if you want to get anything done in the black community, you have to have black women. It just does not get done if we're not involved. So if our goal is to truly move our community forward using tech, we have to engage black women. It's, it's, um, there's a logical reason why we do that. In terms of the H-1 visa, um, I'm not so sure if it, it displaces. I think it's, it's almost a, um, I think sometimes it, it becomes an either or sort of situation. It really doesn't have to be. Um, we focus on recruitment and, and looking at the recruitment dollars of a company like Microsoft. So we say to Microsoft, you're already spending 10, 20, whatever millions of dollars in recruiting. Why not take a chunk of that and work with us and really get this pipeline right into your company? And that has nothing to do necessarily with the H-1 visa because that's usually a separate part of the, a separate chunk of money. Um, but that is a really hot topic right now. And I feel like it's almost two groups being pitted against each other. Um, which I think is very unfair, and it's not a trap that I allow us to get into. Um, Google has quite a number of billions of dollars in the bank. Um, these tech companies are making lots and lots of money. It's, they can do both. Yeah. Um, yeah, absolutely. Thank you for the question. I think um, anytime we, as asset owners, raise questions around diversity or, or whatever it may be, uh, it's powerful, it's heard. Um, and this question of diversity at the board level, um, I mean, we're asking the question of our grantees as well. Like, what is, you know, wh what's up with this all white, generally not male, but uh, all white um, leadership team that you have? Um, so I think it is critical that we, uh, as, as foundations, do raise these questions, um, so thank you. And can I say one thing please, too? Please. The, the, I think there's this belief that the only investment in the pipeline is traditional education, like giving scholarships. There are other ways to invest in the pipeline that is not just giving scholarships or giving chunks of money to MIT or Stanford or other organizations. I mean, there's some non-traditional ways and there's a lot of discussions happening. Um, even within the black community right now, about whether or not even the college route is the best route. Is it college or is it more apprenticeship model, um, learning how to develop and code? You don't need to go to college to know how to code. You don't. You don't even really need to go to college to get a job as a junior developer right now. And so I would encourage you all to look at alternative models, not just the traditional ways um, in which to increase and develop the pipeline. So with that, I want to show the video that Catherine bought before we go to a close. Oh, no, get that? Oh, did I, did I throw us off? Sorry. I hope it's entertaining enough to close with. It's okay. It's okay. If not, we... Oh, no, that's okay. Okay. Um, with that, let me just throw in one more question for you, Mark, before we leave. Um, and then we'll see if we can get the video. So we've talked a lot about collaboration outside the box and diversification. I want to hear some thoughts on the movie you're making um, because we know what's going to happen um, in terms of we, we kind of know what happened with the jury and, and that kind of thing. So what is the, what is the diverse or different story uh, that you want to be able to put forth around that using Justin as kind of an archetype for what's happening in the world? Um, yeah, okay, so f for those who don't know very quickly, um, so Jordan Jet Davis was this 17-year-old uh, uh, black teenager who was in a car with three other boys in a gas station car park in Jacksonville, Florida. 
Um, and this uh, white middle-aged guy called Michael Dunn pulled up next to him in the gas station car park. His partner, Rhonda, went into the gas station to go and buy a bottle of wine. The boys were playing really loud hip-hop. Um, Michael Dunn asked them to turn it down. They did at first. Then they got into a bit of a kind of fuck you argument over the volume of the... They, they turned it back up again, got into an argument. And then uh, Michael Dunn shot Jordan Davis three times. Uh, and as the car was reversing to get away, put a further seven bullets into the back of this retreating car. Rhonda then comes out of the gas station, gets in the car, they drive off and go and stay in a hotel for the night um, without reporting this incident to the police. And later that night, Jordan dies in hospital. Um, and Michael Dunn is arrested the next morning when eventually the police find out uh, the number plate, etc., etc. And, and Michael Dunn basically claimed self-defense, saying that he saw Jordan Davis pull out a gun, and that's the reason he pulled out his gun and shot. Um, so the way, and at the time we started the film, um, it was about six months after the shooting, and the trial, it was six months away from the first trial, and the result of the first trial on the count that mattered, which was first degree murder, there was a mistrial because the jury couldn't come to a decision as to whether that self-defense was justified or not, even though the police never found a gun. Um, and at least three of the jury decided that, sided with Michael Dunn in the sense that they believed that there was a self-defense claim was justified. He was then retried um, a couple of weeks ago and was actually found guilty of first degree murder and is now spending the rest of his life in prison. Um, so we, uh, we basically spent the last year with the family of Jordan um, and we got access to film the trial. Um, we also got access to Michael Dunn's phone calls from prison to his fiance. Mm which are amazing and, and hugely revealing and were a way that we could build up that character. Um, so I think our biggest thing that we tried to do with the film was for as long as, which, which sounds quite disturbing, but there's a reason for it. Um, we tried to create as much empathy as we could, which lasts for about 25 minutes um, of the hour and a half. Uh, with Michael Dunn's mm. side of the story. Um, and we did that because there would have been a big narrative problem if Michael Dunn was the kind of devil from the outset, because there would be nowhere to go with that character. And if you're, there would be nothing to reveal about what's really happening behind the scenes of this story. So using his phone calls, um, he, in his phone calls, he expressed how unjust this situation was that he was, because uh, he didn't get any bail, so he's basically been in prison since this happened. Anyway, he, could, he had a lot of disbelief that he was in prison. Um, he, he blamed it all on the boys. He said that the boys would probably lie when they took the stand and not explain that they had a gun, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So I, I do actually believe that he believes he saw a gun, mm -hmm. at least at, uh, for most of my last year, I believe that. Um, Anyway, so, so by building uh, empathy with Michael Dunn, I think, or I hope, it's not finished yet, but I hope what we've uh, tried to do is put the audience in the position of the jury. Um, and also, I think that because of the way, in my, you know, in the way that I would see it, that we are all have been conditioned to respond to a Jeep with four black kids playing hip hop with hoods. The, the response to that is, as we all know, like very predictable from a, from a white standpoint. Um, now, not everyone would then reach into their glove box, pull out a gun and murder somebody. But I think that initial reaction of awareness 
or even as far as fear, um, is something that a lot of audience members, whether they want to admit it or not, would have that, that similar reaction. So we basically tried to use the Michael Dunn character to make the audience reflect on how they would have reacted in that situation. Okay. And, uh, and obviously, I think most, <laughs> most people wouldn't do the killing part. Um, <laughs> let's, let's hope not. I let's hope, hope. Yeah. Let's hope not. Let's hope not. Yeah. Well, thank you. We look forward to that. Yeah. So let me, we're going to close with the clip, but I want to thank Anne and Mark. Oh, no clip. OK, no sorry. Clip. Not, well, so is it on the website? Yes. OK, go to the website <laughs> and check out the clip. Let me thank Anne, Mark, and Catherine for joining us. Uh, I hope that this has been engaging and entertaining. It's been a diverse reflection on how you can use money, philanthropy, most importantly, the desire and the power to make change in very different ways. So thank you all for your time. Thanks. Thank you.